Hello and a very warm welcome to another episode of the Liz Our Wellbeing Show. Well, today I am joined by Sasha Bates, a psychotherapist, journalist and former documentary filmmaker. While working in television, Sasha wrote, directed and produced series as varied as The Brilliant, Grand Designs and How to Look Good Naked. And it was while working in television that she met her husband, the actor and playwright Bill Cashmore. Sasha was 35 and Bill was 42. They had a whirlwind romance and within just a few months they were happily living together. Now, it was Sasha's fascination with people that drove her career in television, but after 18 years in the industry, she decided to retrain as an integrative psychotherapist to better develop an understanding of the human mind, our emotions and relationships. And grief was one of the most common reasons a client might find themselves on Sasha's therapy couch. And she became well-versed in helping clients navigate this really painful journey and make sense of often senseless loss. But nothing would quite prepare her for her own life being turned upside down suddenly in 2017 when her husband died unexpectedly at the age of 56. She writes in her new book, Languages of Loss, I lost my partner, best friend, lover, soulmate, companion, and I also lost my future. I lost a huge chunk of myself. I lost the ground beneath my feet. I lost hope. I lost the will to live. The book offers a searingly honest account of her loss alongside all that she's learned about grief over the years of counselling others. We've just had a really moving and honest conversation about why she decided to write the book, the taboos and the myths that surround grief, and her advice for those struggling with grief or supporting a loved one through a loss. She's got so much wisdom to share on this topic, and I do hope that you'll share widely with anyone who's been bereaved in your own life. So without further ado, let's hear it from Sasha. So Sasha, really warm welcome to my podcast. It's so lovely to have you with us. Thank you. Um, can we start off by talking about Bill? How, how did you meet him? We actually met on a Greek island uh, where we'd oh. both uh, gone on holiday separately alone and, and we met there, um, became instant friends. And uh, when we got home, we realised we actually knew about six people in common. So all these people could have introduced <laughs> us back in London. None of them ever did. Um, yeah. Funny. Yeah, massive coincidence, though it did sort of feel meant to be right place, right time, all of that. Meant to be. And how would you describe him to those who hadn't met him? Oh, he was fabulous. He was a really big personality. He had incredible humour and wit, very deadpan. You'd think he was just this sort of quiet, unassuming um, man sitting in the corner, not paying any attention. And then he'd just suddenly cut in with, with something very acerbic <laughs> and hilarious and make you realise that all this time he'd been clocking everything that was going on. And then... Mm. Observational humour, based on what he'd, uh, based on what he'd, he'd noticed. So yeah. he was, um, very warm, very generous, very funny, very clever, very quick. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, any bereavement obviously is just such a shock and so difficult. But Bill's death was particularly sudden, wasn't it? What happened? Yeah, I mean, he was fit. He was 56. He was training for his third marathon. He's vegetarian. Mm. He didn't drink much. He didn't smoke fighting fit, so we thought, and then one day clutched his heart in agony, um, rushed to the hospital, got diagnosed with what uh, I now know is an aortic dissection, which is something I've never heard of, which is where your aorta can just split. Um, mm. And uh, it turns out that it's something that it's almost impossible to know that you got a week aorta almost impossible to know that this can happen there's no signs um the only thing that occasionally people know that they're at risk of it is that if they have high blood pressure which he didn't have so yeah completely came out of the blue had heart surgery that day thought it was all going to be fine next day realized that whilst the aorta had been split and the blood had been kind of cascading around his body it caused a blood clot which then ultimately starved the oxygen to his brain so the next day we were told that 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 it was all over and so yeah absolutely 
you rug pulled out from underneath of you. What a roller coaster, 48 hours that you, you must have gone through from, you know, deep despair to hope and joy to despair and, you know, ultimately having having to face the wor- worst news. What shape then did your grief take in, in the weeks and the months that followed Bill's death? Well, I think because it was a very traumatic death, initially there was a lot of denial and shock and numbing and dissociation. Um, and I didn't really take it in. I was sort of going through the motions. Um, it was very much feeling like I was a character in a, in a sitcom, not a sitcom, a, a casual, you know, like casualty, a hospital drama. Yeah. And, and watching myself from a distance, really, which is, a, a, you know, what happens in dissociation. Mm just didn't seem possible that we could go from having a perfectly normal life with lots of plans and a future um and as a couple to suddenly you know me on my own and him him gone so the book languages of loss that i wrote came out of that really um it was just me trying to make sense initially it was me trying to make sense of what was just a completely inconceivable um change what yeah. was your background before that? What what led you to actually write the book or, or to feel confident enough to write it? Yeah, I had worked in television. I was a filmmaker, a director for many years, for 17 years. So I, I had always written my scripts. Mm. I was also a travel writer. I was a journalist as, as well, uh, sporadically. Um, I had left all that behind about um, seven or eight years previously to, to train as a psychotherapist, but I'd carried on with the tra- I'd left telly behind, but I carried on as a travel writer. So, so yeah, I was a ex filmmaker, journalist, yes. psychotherapist, which is sort of an odd combination, but it turned out to be the combination of things that I needed to be able to write a book that gave me the sort of I suppose the experience of working in documentaries that I was able to bring my own experience in the therapeutic knowledge to be able to then have a reflection on and a a sort of an observer status as to what might Mm. be going on um from from a theoretical perspective um plus the sort of the journalistic skills to sort of get that down so it was a weird combination of things that that led to me writing the book yeah. And interestingly, you know, your, your background as a travel writer, because we often hear about the the journey of mm-hmm. the stages of grief, if you like, which kind of starts with the initial shock. Yeah. And then you get the grief and then you get the anger and the, and the depression and, you know, mm-hmm. maybe gradually the acceptance. I don't know. What's what's your take on that? And, and does it really go through those stages? Can everybody expect to feel those stages? Well, again, this is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I feel like there's definitely those five famous stages, they're in there. I mean, I I definitely had all those experiences. But what I felt was that those that theory and there were many other grief theories. That's just the sort of the most famous one. I just felt it didn't really sort of touch the sides of what I was feeling, of the enormity of what I was feeling. It felt very limiting. It felt very linear. Even the word stages makes it sound yes. like a path and a journey and you kind of get through it. And, and the fact that acceptance was at the end of it. I mean, there is a cert- there is a sort of acceptance. There has to be. However, I think that's a very ambiguous word that can acceptance can mean all sorts of things so that's partly why I called it languages plural of loss because I felt that we have to be so careful with the language that we choose because it can mean different things to different people and there's so many different ways of describing it so we use various metaphors visualizations um and uh other other ways dreams dream language um Mm. to try and describe my journey which in itself can be problematic to yeah. that, that that word so I tend to use words more like shapes of grief rather than stages of grief because they come back they're not linear you know they're right. around and you will go in and out of them and they still come back I mean I'm three and a half years on and you know I still sometimes get whacked yes. <laughs> by, by them so um yeah so I, I find words and language quite interesting around it yeah, I, I've got a friend who who was bereaved a few years ago. She lost her husband relatively quickly, um, and she she does say that she says that you know she, she will suddenly be hit by something, 
and it will come back w with a jolt I mean, out of the blue. Something might, you know, take her back to a moment or remind her. Yeah. Um, whereas she thinks and, you know, she's been acting as if everything is, you know, not quite back to normal, but she's, you know, coping well. And then all of a sudden she'll be kind of blindsided by something coming in. Yeah, and I think blindsides is, is a really good word because when it happens, it feels like no time has passed and you just feel like you're right back there. At the right. Um, and it feels as intense, um, which is why I think people can get a bit thrown by the fact that I, I ought to be over this by now or I'm right. Really, it should be different. But I think I, I think those things just keep, keep happening and yeah. you just kind of hope that they are less intense and less frequent and that you yeah. like, recognize them better and you have better ways of dealing with them so you're not mm. quite flawed or mm. at least for quite so long or you understand that that it will pass yeah you write about um is it william warden's grief theory yes. and the four tasks that have yes. to be completed to yes. get through grief so what what are what are these tasks so so warden's four tasks are much harder to remember than kubler ross's five stages which is why i think she's kind of passed into common parlance more but they're very similar so the tasks are the first one is accept the reality of the loss, which is very similar to um, denial. The second one is work through the pain of the grief, uh, which again is similar to her saying that you're going to have anger and depression and feelings around it. The third one is adjust to an environment in which the deceased is missing, which I guess is about maybe the bargaining stage of Kubler-Ross. It's a bit like, okay, I have to somehow reshift my thinking. I have to somehow get on board yeah. with the fact that um, my environment is different and I can't go back and this is the new reality. And then the fourth one is the wordiest of all. It is to find an enduring connection with the deceased while embarking on a new life. Now, that one, I think, comes a bit closer to what some of the other theories, which maybe I, I can talk about in a minute, mm. um, uh, touch upon, which is that you do have to continue. You do have to find what I think, you know, Kubler Ross would call acceptance. But you have to do it knowing that the person uh, was in your life. It's not about what the old sort of Freudian theories might have said, which is, work through it, get over it, shut the door, they're, they're dead to you. and Move you, on. Um, it's much more realising mm. that you, they're still with you and that uh, the experience, both of having them and of having lost them, has fundamentally changed you. You can't go back. You can only go forward with that new you um, and that new experience on board as, as well. So it's a bit more complex, but that it needs to be. And the, the other couple of theories that I talk about are more complex still. But again, they need to be because it's not as simple as just saying, you know, bit of anger, bit of depression, bit of bargaining, except done. <laughs> yes. Were there any in particular that resonated with you that you personally found really helpful? Well, my way of describing it was to not really use those tasks, like all the stages. Like I said, they all, I felt I could feel that they were there, they were present. But what I did in the book was my chapters, I suppose, um, correspond to my my shapes, my kind of path. And my it was a very, um, it was I used visualization. It was more based on what I experienced. So my first. Mm -hmm. So I call implosion because that's what it was like. The world just imploded. And I describe yeah. because <clears throat> a little aside, I don't in the book, I don't only talk about the grief theories. I talk about therapeutic theory in general because I think grief isn't separate to real life. It is real life. So all the different therapeutic ways of looking at how we are and how we've come to be and how we cope with life um, is based on so many factors um, and that is going to impact how we cope with our grief as well so we can't just put our normal personalities aside and say okay so this is what you're going to be in grief because all, all of your personality traits are going to affect how you do your own version of grief so um, there's a theory that calls attachment theory which says that how we are parented in the first couple of years of life how we attach to our caregivers will affect all subsequent relationships and it also says that we need to be able to explore our lives um, in every sense of that word. We need to have a secure base. 
So my visualization, so it's a very long-winded way of explaining my, my progression, is that my secure base was built. So I have this image of this huge um, shipping tanker that was sailing merrily across the ocean, and it was solid, and it was absolutely impenetrable, and then that imploded. So the safe ship that was Bill and I imploded. So that's, that's my first chapter heading which is implosion and that's a noun after that they're all verbs again because I feel that grief's constantly shifting and changing and so you can't have a noun that says now you're going through this it's a verb to say it's an ongoing evolving yeah. shape-shifting thing so the second chapter I call uh, scattering and that I liken to being in this ocean the ship's exploded I'm in this sort of dark deadly ocean and all around me the shards of what was the tanker are now raining down on me and sort of um like um piercing wow. so yeah. then everything is scattered because when you lose somebody so close to you you also lose a part of yourself you lose your future you lose who you were with them you lose your sense of safety um and so it did feel like um flailing around and in fact flailing is my third um, right. That's the heading. So I go implosion, scattering, flailing. And the flailing is you sort of come back from under the, the depths where you feel that you're drowning. You're sort of flailing about. You're trying to grab all these little bits of detritus and make them into a little bit of a raft that you can then hang on to to somehow yes. get you back. Um, then where did I, again, I'm, my memory is appalling. So then from scattering, I get um, scattering, flailing, floating. So you right. gather what little bits of yourself and your life and your friends that you can, you create a little bit of a raft and then you're floating. And it's like, oh, I can yeah. him. I'm no longer being constantly buffeted by the waves, but it's still a very meager existence. So then eventually you start to think, okay, can I do more than just float? And my next chapter title was balancing because I felt that I, that more adequately to me describes how you do sort of go in and out of it. A lot of the time you feel, oh, no, okay, you know, I've got this. I'm on, I'm on this sort of fairly stable raft. So I can go out. I can see my friends. I can maybe go back to work. But yeah. always that danger that you're going to fall back in. You don't have a secure base. It's a very wobbly base. From, um, flow, uh, from balancing, I go to sailing and that's when you've kind of created the raft has become more of a sort of a sailing boat so you feel safer you've got your friends you've got your work you've got your life back a little bit but you're still on an ocean you're still not, not on solid ground you yeah still... you're not on an ocean liner are you you're, you've got no. you've got your tail up you're still a bit vulnerable exactly and you still know mm. that you know a storm could come that it gets seasick you get seasick it gets rocky but you also have yeah. lots of long days when you can you know lie on the deck with the gin and tonic and say, do you know what, life's good. It's, it can be, it's not the same, you know, it can be great. And then I did it for ages over my final chapter because in many ways it would have been quite neat to ha call it landing and feeling like, right, I've reached, reached shore. And I thought, no, that is too neat because you, because as we just talked about, you never really do reach solid ground. Um, so I called it swimming because I felt that that gave a sense of, you can feel okay. You can feel that okay most of the time. You can have a nice life. You can, you know, find joy again, which mm. is important as well. I think you do have to find joy again. And you can also choose to get back in the water. You can go back in and you can swim and feel empowered within that mass of feelings. But you can touch back in them without feeling like they're going to drown you. But you can say, no, I can go back. I can revisit the pain and how much I felt for Bill and how amazing he was and how sad I am and how much I miss him. But I'm choosing to do that knowing that I can get myself back out again and that I can swim through it rather than be drowned. Yes. By it. So I'm sorry, that was an incredibly long answer. No, I, I love it. I love your analogies. And I was just thinking as I was listening to you talk, whether these are the same principles that could be helpful for other kinds of loss. So for example, people who may have been dumped by their spouse and suddenly find themselves divorced yeah. or made redundant after a lifetime of working for the same firm you know do you think these same principles could apply 
I think I think that's a really good point, and I think they absolutely could. I think loss is loss, and um, in fact, I've had a couple of divorced friends say exactly that. That um, it really described what they went through. Um, yeah, their very shapes of, of coping with the loss, and yeah, job loss and all of those things. Loss of your youth, <laughs> you know. Yes. Loss of your- oh gosh. <laughs> loss of your- going off to university. I mean, we- yeah, you know, the loss showed us anything losses are you know innumerable and constant and always with us Uh, yes and and will happen to all of us we will all lose we will all lose friends family situations you know life is is ever changing let's talk a little bit about some of the physical changes that can happen you know what what's going on within our central nervous system for example during such a big trauma as grief yeah when we are faced with any sort of trauma, and yes, grief is, is and especially traumatic um, loss, is uh, we switch into our trauma response, which is the fight, flight, freeze response, which is when our nervous system pretty much um, shuts down everything that isn't to do with survival. So we go into the mode that is most going to keep us alive, which is actually a very primeval response. We resort to our what's called our limbic brain. Before the neocortex, the thinking brain, was developed, the limbic brain was the thing that got us to like run away from the, the lion or now gets us to jump out of the way of a, a speeding car. Um, and that's what, it's a physiological response. We can't choose to go into it. Our bodies, mm-hmm. our limbic brain, our nervous system takes us there. And it's really helpful because it does mean that we kind of pull back from danger. Um, but it does mean that a lot of other things shut down, which is why right. you get very foggy, your, your brain's not thinking right, you do strange things, you feel very confused, your memory goes. Um You often don't eat, you don't sleep, because all of those non-essential functions uh, are going into just sort of keeping your heart going, really, Um, which is great in the moment. But what happens so often is that that in the moment instant life-saving response doesn't switch Mm. off. It carries on and we carry on responding as though we're still in that moment of of trauma. And that's when it leads to all sorts of... um, you know, your immune system will then get compromised, you'll get aches and pains, you'll get a bad back, you might, you know, have heart problems, you might have a stroke. I mean, there's so many ways in which it's going to come out physically. And the more, this is why it's really important to try and express and go and work with your feelings when you can. And maybe you need a professional or maybe you need, you know, supportive friends to help you do that. No matter how much you might want to just busy yourself with, okay, right, let's just keep going and let's just get back to work. Yeah. It is important because the body never forgets. The body is storing the things that the brain doesn't want to let us think about. So it will come out. It will come out in your skin. It will come out in your aches and pains. It will come out in not sleeping. Um, You you, you talk in the book about dealers and feelers. Is that related to that? Yes. I mean, dealers and feelers is a very shorthand way of describing sort of two sets of... uh, people and obviously we are all many many things this is very reductionist but we do often tend in to either be somebody who can deal but can't feel or somebody who can feel but can't deal I was a dealer I am a dealer Bill was a a, a feeler so and that often happens people are kind of drawn Mm. and do the thing that you can't so I'm very good at coping I'm very good at going right let's solve this what needs to be done let's just keep busy let's not think about it ignore all these messages of sort of pain and sadness and anger and just kind of say, nope, don't need to think about them, which makes you very good in a crisis, but does mm. mean, as I said, kind of suppressing, suppressing, suppressing. Billy was a feeler, so he was very good at emoting and being warm and being really kind of in touch with what he was feeling. And But it did mean that in a crisis, he often would, you know, run around a bit like a headless chicken and not really know how to cope because he was so busy emoting and feeling. And neither one is better it what we both need is to have a little bit of the other ideally we manage to integrate that in ourselves we don't just outsource it to our partner although that can happen quite a lot um so as a therapist when I see people that are completely up in their heads the dealers and I obviously relate to them better I have to constantly say what's the feeling what are you feeling about this you know can you really just let yourself go with the sadness go with the anger 
Whereas the feelers who sit there sort of weeping or shouting or stamping their feet, my role as a therapist then is to say, okay, let's just think about this. Can we can we think about right. why these feelings feel so so overwhelming? Why you can't pull yourself together? Can we think about what's going on and help them to reclaim some of their more cognitive function? So it's about having access to both because they're both really useful sets of information, but not when we only rely on them at the expense of the other information that because that's good too. That is so interesting. Can we go back to some of the practicalities now? For example, how did you find Bill's funeral? I mean, mm. suddenly you are plunged into a whole new experience. I and mean, I don't know about you, but I haven't had to plan somebody's funeral. So that whole process, you know, do you do you think that process of planning a funeral and attending a funeral helps with the grieving process and and how was it for you yeah I mean it absolutely did and that's why you know my heart goes out to all those people that have lost people during COVID and haven't been able to do that I mean I think over over the last year people have adapted really well and found ways to you know do it online if we're not to feel like a, a, a poor substitute but yes I think in, in normal times, and for me, the funeral was really helpful. It gives you a focus. It keeps you connected. It, it, you feel like in those early weeks, I think Bill's funeral was three weeks after his death, it gives you some way of feeling like you're still doing something for them. You are still acting on their behalf. You are still helping them when actually you can't, obviously. But you need that kind of illusion that I'm doing this for you. I'm going to give you the absolute best thing I can give you. It keeps you thinking about them. It keeps you kind of going back through the photos and the music and the memories and the stories. It keeps you connected yes. with their friends. You kind of get stories coming in from other people. You, you get to talk about them the whole time. Um, you get to really kind of be with who they were. Um, and then you have a fantastic day of just celebrating them and emoting together and seeing how much other people were impacted, which I think is really important as well, is to know that they mattered to somebody else, to know that them dying affects and impacts someone else mm. as well, because it, it just feels, yes, they, they they were here, they were real, they they, they meant something. Um, yeah. So for me, the Gosh, the, the, the whole impact, you're right, of all those people who haven't been able to have funerals this this past year you know during pandemic times is is so tragic isn't it and and maybe we should be thinking maybe that's an interesting message to anybody listening in that situation to maybe have a memorial service or something you know to recognize that your your grief is still there and and it's not you know needn't be closed off we can actually you know bring all those joyful moments and memories perhaps back to the fore for, for a new focus you know when when things are a bit easier in society yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, I've been to a couple of online memorials for, for people that have died and they can be really lovely. And mm. yes, you, you can do some of the things um, that you would normally do in real life. You can have Zoom dinners and Zoom sharings and, and that kind of thing. Not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. And I think, you know, luckily, yeah. soon, we hope, we hope. Um, yeah can then have all those memorials all those um yeah. you know walks to their favorite place all those parties all those meals or whatever it, it mm -hmm. is meaningful yeah. to you. and we do i think we need them so i think there's going to be a lot a lot a lot of celebrating coming up yeah well i do hope so i mean in the book you talk about the importance of breaking down these these taboos that we have in society we don't talk about death mm. we don't talk about grief mm. and it, you know, how important do you think it is to, to start opening up this conversation even more? I think it's massively important. And again, it's why I called the book Languages of Loss, because we need to find ways of talking about it and we need to remove the stigma because otherwise it does just, everyone feels a bit like, oh, you know, I have my little couple of weeks and my my funeral and my talk down, I, I need to shut it down now. And actually, as I said, the more you can talk about it, the more you can keep that person alive, the more you can say, actually, I'm just having a really bad day, even if it is three years on. Um, it will help other people understand right. when it happens to them that they're not weird. I mean, I've had clients come to me and say things like, oh, I just, there's something wrong with me. I can't get over my dad's death. And I'll say, well, how long ago did he die? And they'll say, oh, a couple of weeks. Like, of course, you know, you need to keep talking, but the stuff yes. 
we've got this notion that there's a time limit on it. And then also people are so afraid to talk to us about it in case it makes us more upset. But it's like, we're upset anyway. What you're doing is <laughs> it's an outlet to get that out there. It's not like, oh, I've completely forgotten he died and now you've mentioned it and now I remember again. You know, yeah. it's, oh. like, it's lovely to hear people talk about the person that you love. Because so it's, it's so... You know, I, I think as somebody who wants to talk to those who've been bereaved and, and be helpful, I know I, I find myself hesitant because I don't know whether it's going to open up something that's too painful or I feel awkward. And, you know, what are the best ways, do you think, for friends and family to, to have those conversations and to, to offer support, the best kind of support? Yeah, well, I think, you know, first of all, it is to recognise that it is the hardest job in the world is to talk to somebody about their bereavement um, and it is it is awkward and it is difficult and um, to acknowledge that and to kind of you know have some compassion for yourself around that right you're trying to do a very difficult thing I would say just be really open and honest and say to the person do you want to talk because they might not always you know I'm saying oh everybody mm -hmm. wants to not everybody does want to talk at the time so just say would you like to talk about it so give them that option um yeah express condolences and say you know what is it you you would like to talk about really can I tell you some stories about the person can I ask you how you're feeling you know can I tell you that I feel really sad so just offer offer it as a possibility but one of the other things that I do in the book is I do talk about that um question that everybody says you know what 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 can I do because people do generally want to help and it's a really hard one to answer so um i slightly glibly wrote down a few sort of suggestions of what you can do and ironically it's the thing that so many people it's the thing that most people come back and say oh i really like the bit where you said how to help a grieving friend and it, that just made me realize how much hunger there is out there to know and how much fear there is yeah um, but basically what it all boils down to is um, just be alongside them. You can't solve it. You can't take it away. You can't make it better. So just be with them and say, look, if you want to have a laugh and forget about it, I'm here for you to do that. If you want to cry and be really upset and use my shoulder, I can be that. If you want me to just listen, I can do that. If you want me to just talk, I can do that. And just kind of be with them and say, yeah, this is pretty rubbish, isn't it? This is pretty awful. And just yes. manage it and not try and make it better because you can't you can't no that that whole empathy i guess is just knowing that somebody is there for you and thinking about you actually mm -hmm. that whole human compassion yeah. um, but you write in the book also about humor mm. and, and humor on grief what what i mean how, how how can we make light of it and you know what why do you think that humor is important in all of this to have a bit of a laugh yeah well i think I'm not sure that we can make light of it, but I think when those moments appear to you, you know, go with them. Um, I yeah. think it's very hard to force somebody to to laugh when when they're in the midst of grief. But if you can keep, and again, like I said, I described her right at the beginning as somebody who has very, you know, dry observational humour. So I would find myself just thinking, oh, he would have loved this. You know, when the solicitor's being really clumsy or there's a mistake yes. you know, by the organist in the funeral. I just think, oh, Bill would have loved the fact that this was all, you know, yeah. being a bit wobbly or, or a yeah. bit or a bit British um, and you know even just finding you know seeing people being really awkward in um, or not wanting to make eye contact and being able to sort of say oh gosh we're all being so British about this aren't we or do you know what, what whatever it is so I think that the moments are there and there are some yes. genuinely funny moments when people are trying to do the right thing and you know getting it slightly um, around. So I guess what you're saying is that, that you've got permission to laugh Yes, and I think it's really important to laugh. I, I really do, because it's what makes life worth living. And that's a really hard thing to hang on to in the depths of your grief. It's like, well, yeah. why, why am I even bothering carrying on without yeah. it? Um, and then you think, no, it, you know, life can be good. And me laughing is celebrating his love of humour. It's not me saying, oh, I feel better now, and isn't this funny? It's saying the sadness has to be counteracted with some... Mm -hmm some fun and some laughter um, yeah. I did actually sit and watch some comedies because I just thought after a day of just like doom and gloom and I just can't bear it it's all too agonizing I put Gogglebox on or, or something yeah and 
myself laughing. And yet you do have moments of feeling guilty. How can I be laughing at this? No, it's, I have to, or I can't go back into another day, another several hours of just mm. crying, feeling the agony. I've got to somehow step aside from it, even if just for a few moments. And laughter, I think, is the quickest way of, of yeah. doing that. You now run workshops on grief. So yes. what are the, the basic sort of, what's the basic journey? Is, is, is there a process? Obviously, it's going to be very individualized, but are there certain, is there a certain journey that, that you would take grievers on with your workshops? Um, well, to be honest, the workshops that I teach are for therapists who work, work with grievers. I, I've been thinking about possibly doing some that are directed at the grievers themselves. But, but so what I've been doing in, in them is to um, use different ways of allowing people to get at their grief. It's about finding ways to express your grief. Um, so um, there's all sorts of things that I do over the course of the day with the, the therapists that, that they can do with their clients. So it's things like journaling. That's really mm. important. It was me journaling that sort of led to me writing the book, ultimately. Right to get your feelings down on paper or if you're not good with words or you don't like words you know you can get the paints out do try and you know depict in art or in music so find a creative way to somehow express what you are feeling and if you're really not creative in any way at all you know get gardening or go to an art gallery go you know listen to some music try and find yeah. something or poetry something that can somehow express for you, what you can't express, because it is really hard to articulate um, such huge emotions. Whereas you can look at a painting and go, that's it, that's how I feel, or listen to some music and say, they're saying it for me, or a poet is saying it for me. So there's the sort of the creative side of doing an activity that gets you out of that thinking brain, that we all know if we do some art or some music, it's not coming from that same left brain, left rational brain. Yeah. Amazing. Moving really important and whatever that means to you whether it is just a gentle walk whether it's like running it out whether it's yoga whether it's um swimming you know just find some way of dissipating the, those stress hormones that were generated in the moment of trauma getting them out dance the dance well it doesn't have to be like structured exercise um so some sort of physical release is really really helpful mm. Um, being in nature I mean just getting out all the research now is saying that any connection and I'm, again over this last year I think a lot of us have discovered that um, anyway through our enforced entrapment um, just getting out into you know by the sea or into a park or into your garden or just seeing something green and connecting with nature cuddling your pets you know back in the old days cuddling your friends getting some kind of you know sensations yeah. some of touch reawakening your senses via smells and candles and you know again nature or cooking the sensation of touch through facials and massages and cuddling yeah. people when we could or cuddling our cats when we when we can't um listening to sounds you know listening to music listening to bird song um just try mm. and get those sensations awakened again because we Again, part of the trauma response because it, everything gets deadened. We don't want to be touched. Everything sort of like gets yes. smaller and drier and more shriveled up and more clenched. And it's trying to sort of come back to life again. It's sort of like, yes, I'm here. I'm breathing. I'm opening to the world again. Um, so it's those, those sort of things, really. In, in fact, um, I should, I'm not meant to be talking about this because I'm talking about languages of loss, but I've actually got another book that's coming out in June. Called... I was going to ask you what's what, what's next for you because this is this has been such an extraordinary and positive journey. What what is next? Uh, well, it's it's a new book called A Grief Companion, which I wrote in the first lockdown, and it pretty much came out of what I explained just now about how people responded to the, here's a list of things you can do for your grieving friends. I realized that there was such a hunger for practical advice, which is very yeah. hard to get because everybody's grief journey is different and what everybody needs and wants is different. But I realized how much people wanted. And then the book came out at the beginning of lockdown and I was doing a lot of interviews and press and everyone was like, right, it's COVID, it's lockdown, we're all suffering loss. What are the top five tips? And I thought, <laughs> 
you can't boil it down into five tips, but again, it just made me realize how much people kind of want some sort of yeah. guidebook. So a grief companion is, is a book full of suggestions. It's not saying this will work because who knows what work even means and what works for some won't work for others. But there's a, just a plethora of examples of, of things that you might find are useful to do um, in those early months when you can't think straight, when your world has imploded, when you just feel like you can't get out of bed or that you can't stop being completely busy, you know, whatever version it, it takes. So yeah. that's, um, yeah, that's coming out in June. It's, a, you know, a sort of a companion piece to the languages of this. Wonderful. Well, I wish you huge success with it. It actually sounds as though both books actually are the kind of essential books that we all need on our bookshelves so that we've got them to hand because we never know when yeah. we might need them and actually being prepared, you know, to, to read about the languages of loss yeah. and how we can apply that to so many different things in our lives and then actually have something there as the emergency guide for when we need it could be so helpful. Yeah. Sasha, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to chat and I'm really looking forward to reading the new one as well. Oh, great. And thank you for having me. It's been lovely being able to talk to you. I'm sorry I did most of the talking. I feel like I completely... That's what you were meant to do. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Take care. And that is it for today's episode. Huge thanks to Sasha. And as always, you will find links and resources that we mentioned over on lizardwellbeing.com. There you can sign up for my free weekly newsletter filled with well-being wisdom for navigating the inevitable ups and downs that life brings. Huge thanks to all those who leave us such lovely reviews. It really does help others to find the show. We are truly grateful. So until the next time we chat, go well. Bye. Bye. The Lizelle Wellbeing Show is presented by me, Lizelle, with production by Amaral Lizelle and Harry Trevithick at Heart Dialogue. With thanks to my producer, Ellie Smith, and guest booker, Millie de la Morinière. <laughs>